Hi, Jeff Spire here again. And today I'm going to tell you an interesting story about a voyage. Uh, at least some would say there was a voyage there, but who knows? Um, in about 1280, a group of Japanese Buddhist pilgrims um, traveled to the shores of California in seagoing ships crossing the North Pacific from Japan. They migrated from there uh, in search of uh, an entrance to a great Buddhist mythical city. Um, and when they arrived uh, at what they believed the spiritual center of the world was, they met up with the Anasazi tribe of Native Americans that inhabited the Four Corners area of northern Arizona and western New Mexico. Meeting was a friendly one, and they exchanged technologies and languages and joined to later become the Zuni tribe. Now, I know some, what some of you are thinking. What kind of crazy talk is this? Um, uh, there was this uh, PhD uh, um, person and named Nancy Yaw Davis from, this, uh, from the University of Washington um, that studied this, uh, this concept for 20 years and finally published her uh, scientific work in a book called The Zuni Enigma. And I have a copy of it, and I've studied it and read it and, and know a little bit about uh, what some of the things that she was talking about. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty amazing story. Um, Modern-day Zunis uh, have Japanese genes. Uh, it just is that way. Um, they have uh, a language filled with Japanese words and grammar, and their spiritual beliefs uh, have a strong Japanese influence. Um, and at that time, um, it, the Japanese uh, had the shipbuilding technology, the navigational knowledge, and they had the reason to make such a voyage to America to, to uh, come and visit this area. So. Well, first we're going to have to roll the clock back to Japanese, early Japanese history. Um, in uh, about 720 AD, um, the, the, a, kind of a change happened in Japan, and it was the organization of the um, uh, classical period of Japan. Uh, it was, uh, the capital was established in the city of Nara, and later in 1794, it was moved to what uh, was, is now known as Kyoto. Then it was called Heian Kyo. And this was called the Heian period. So from uh, the mid 700 AD's until um, 1185 AD. Uh, so that was, that was a, quite a number of years of, of times. Uh, this was called the Japanese Heian period. Um, before this, this Heian period, Japan was very heavily influenced by China. So it's government arts, architecture, written language, and nearly all other aspects of Japanese life were this, basically the same as, as uh, um, the Cantonese area of China. Where, so um, there was a lot of trade back and forth, uh, people traveling and that sort of thing. Um, during the classical period, the Heian, the Japanese separated uh, culturally con from China um, considerably. So they, they, uh, their language changed, uh, the arts changed, the, um, the clothing, uh, ceramics, lacquerware, music, traditions, ceremonies, you know, a lot of different cultural developments uh, changed in Japan to this, in this Heian area. Era and and they survive today. So uh, in Japan, this is kind of known as the classical period, and this is kind of where Japanese culture um, really established itself uh, in in the Heian era. So um, a lot of the days, the, the the national holidays, for instance, are based in Heian times, like a Girls' Day and that sort of thing. It's all it's all. Uh, based on that, the Heian rulers and uh, that sort of thing. So, um, so at, you know, just before the Heian era, era broke out, um, around 538 AD, 
uh, Buddhism was introduced to, to Japan. Uh, it came from China, of course. Um, and the Japanese uh, adopted Buddhism quite a bit. Uh, there's, there's many Buddhist uh, temples in Japan, and, and uh, Buddhism originated, of course, in India, and then it went to China and then uh, arrived in Japan. So, um, and it did not conflict with Japanese, uh, their natu their, I don't want to say, their native um, religion, which is Shinto. Uh, so it's commonly thought that uh, that Japanese are Buddhists for this life and Shinto for the next, and a lot of them say Christian just in case. So <laughs> um, but there were hard times in Japan, um, of course, for some people. But but the Heian era was considered very very good times. The economy flourished well. Artisans were free to express themselves. There was very little conflict. Um, so there were no wars with neighboring nations. Um, the Heian government had a strong sense of law and order. They maintained property rights. They ruled benevolently. And they also had a fairly strong military. And uh, it also served as their police force, so the, uh, the, the, the Heian era soldiers. So as the Heian uh, era progressed, the army became less and less controlled by the central government and more and more controlled by local governors, you know, warlords, uh, they, they called them later, but they were actually just, um, you know, local uh, political heads, I, let's put it that way. So allegiances kind of shifted the um, uh, Heian era era came crashing down in, in the mid-1100s or late 1100s um, uh, because dissatisfied lords, you know, refused to take, pay taxes to the federal government and, and they started using these um, branches of the military that were under their control as, as personal armies. So, and then they, uh, they ended up getting in squabbles and battles and, um, and that brought an end to the whole Kyoto power base there, the Heian era base. So um, it gave way to what's called the Kamakura era. And uh, this era became when the capital was established in the city of Kamakura, uh, which is in Kanto, which is the uh, general area of uh, Tokyo. It's um, a long ways from, from uh, Kyoto, where it is closer to Osaka. So it's um, uh, Kamakura is, a, is, a, is a next to Yokohama, so it's not really Edo or Tokyo that, that became later um, back in, the, in the, you know, the samurai times and the shogun times. That was uh, much later. That was, uh, you know, five or six hundred years later. So um, in 1190 AD, uh, a new version of Buddhism was introduced in Japan. And this was called Zen Buddhism. You may have heard the term. It's a, it's a kind of a fusion of Buddhism with the ancient uh, Chinese philosophy of Tao. So, um, so Zen Buddhism stressed minimalism, being at peace, being centered without motion or conflict. So um, Zen Buddhism was um, spread throughout the Japanese society and very much so in, in the uh, high levels of the military and members of the army and navy. They were all became Zen Buddhists. So it was uh, in conflict with the tumultuous times in Japan uh, that was experienced uh, in the early parts of the Kamakura era. So um, <clears throat> you can imagine that generals and admirals um, could see how, you know, could get fed up with, with what was going on and may have gone looking for a different place, you know, to live. So it's not so difficult to imagine they could uh, f finance and access weapons and ships and, and, and recruit followers who were able-bodied and skilled, you know, uh, to make such a journey uh, from the homeland to some better place. So, but where would they go, you know? So um, one of the concepts of Buddhism is that uh, superhuman beings established the center of the earth. And um, you may have heard the term Shangri-La. Uh, that's how they refer to it in China. Um, 
another term you may have heard uh, from an old song is Shambhala, which is the which is another it's the Indian version I, I believe of Shangri-La, which is the Chinese way it's uh, spoken there, and it's accessible through a cave or a tunnel from the Earth's surface. It's an underground place. So there's supposedly two entrances to to Shambhala. Uh, I uh, directly opposed to each other on the Earth. So. Um, you know, the, in Buddhism, it's uh, Shangri-La is is accepted to be uh, somewhere in the Himalayas. You know, the mountains. So, there was a book and movie came out some years back by James Hilton called Lost Horizons that that fictionalizes this Buddhist concept of a of a Shangri-La place where um, superhuman beings exist and all is peaceful. Uh, it's con it's kind of considered the center of the earth. So. The Japanese knew these stories, um, that it, it was a calm place, and uh, they also knew that Shangri-La um, was to the west of them, so they thought if they could go east, maybe they would uh, run into it. So Now, the Japanese ships of the, of the Heian area were very well constructed for deep-sea travel. Um, they were larger than the galleons that was sailed by Columbus, in many ways more seaworthy. You know, they had extensive trading contact, uh, contacts with China, Korea, Taiwan, and other ports, you know, in Southeast Asia. Um, that was long before the Edo period came along, which was uh, the, uh, you know, the Shogun times, uh, when travel was banned and it was even illegal to have a ship that could... Uh, uh, cross the ocean. So, um, so, but you know, Japan is a land based on seafood. So, fishermen and whalers uh, have been plying Japanese coastal waters for its entire existence. So, they had good knowledge of seamanship and currents uh, around the area. Um, navigators and ship pilots were an essential part of the military that was that was in Japan at this uh, end of the Heian era. So. Um, at that time, uh, the Heian era ships were t were classically uh, uh, they had uh, woven straw sails. Um, I uh, visited uh, a Japanese maritime museum in Japan and and uh, uh, took this picture of a, of a model of a Heian era ship, and you can see that the uh, that the the sails were made of straw. So. Um, but near the end of the Heian, um, new fibers were developed, and they allowed them to um, to build uh, fabric sails. So, um, because before that, fabrics were mostly silk, and they were used, they were delicate, and they were mostly used for uh, for for clothing. Uh, but uh, the much stronger and more flexible fabrics uh, had been developed that uh, that switched over the uh, hay and straw sails for, um, for fabric sails almost uh, very, very quickly anyway. They just get rid of the hay and sails at the end of the hay and era, the, the straw sails, and, and, and switch to fabric. So uh, It was also certain that uh, Japan had magnetic compasses at that time. You know, uh, Japan had close ties to China. Uh, a lot of trading going on, and uh, all Chinese ships had uh, had compasses aboard them. Um, you know, they, they, the Japanese astronomers knew the Earth was a sphere, and, and they had pretty sophisticated star charts. There's a tomb uh, called Kit Kitora Kofun in a tomb dated uh, the um, Asuka era of Japan, which was 675 to 710 A.D., and there's a sophisticated chart uh, painted in gold in, on the walls and the ceiling of it. And it shows precise positions of the stars and the Tropic of Cancer, the North Pole, other celestial bodies. Everything a celestial navigator would need to, to establish its position was, uh, was in that tomb. So um, They had instruments for uh, celestial navigation at the time, too. Uh, there's a uh, observatory in Nanjing with a cast bronze sextant dated about 1200 A.D. So it's on prominent display. So um, it was, it's a later version of what was known as an amillary sphere, uh, originally designed uh, 
from Emperor Wu's era in the Han Dynasty in 104 BC. So, so all the all the, sh the Japan or the Chinese sailors and and ship captains had had celestial navigation devices, and uh, which would just go to show that so would the. Uh, with the Japanese sailors that uh, they traded with and they were friendly with uh, during the Heian era. So that that information was well available in Japan uh, at this time. So um, in uh, a Chinese writer called Zhu Yu in the Song Dynasty, which was 960 to 1289 AD, wrote a, uh, a, a song, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, a poem called uh, the ship's captain well armed with knowledge of geography observed the stars at night and the sun during the day when it was gloomy he consulted his compass so they they uh, they understood uh, celestial navigation and the use of compass for the determination of uh, north and south <clears throat> Anyway, I spoke a little bit about, uh, uh, in, a, in an earlier video, about the Kuroishi current. I'm sorry, Kuroshio current, uh, passing on the east coast of Japan. It's one of the 17 major currents of the world. And so it runs north from, uh, from Japan uh, to the western uh, roaring 40s, and, uh, you know, the westerly winds. And uh, and they move objects from the coast of Japan uh, to uh, the you know the coast of Oregon in you know in almost all the time. So back when I was in college, the uh, National Fisherman magazine, uh, one of the one of the uh, trawlers up in Oregon, fished out a mine, a Japanese mine, and uh, pretty pretty confident it was used uh, near Tokyo, um, and it made it all the way across the ocean in 30 years. So. Um, from Tokyo to Oregon, so there, there's a there's a strong um, issue of currents there. So, back in 1833, a Japanese uh, sailor by the name of Otokichi Yamamoto, along with three others, uh, drifted across the North Pacific in a disabled ship with a broken mast and rudder. So it took him 14 months to make it across. Uh, from Japan to the Olympic Peninsula of Washington in, eight, in 1833. So the ship was 50 feet long, which was, you know, only about half the length of Columbus's. Um, fortunately, it was a cargo ship, so it had plenty of food aboard. Um, and the Japanese knew in, in 1833 how to desalinate seawater using rice. So they had plenty of food and water. Um, but the lack of fresh vegetables uh, aboard uh, several of the crewmen died of scurvy, which I, I, if, I'll get into s discussions of scurvy in some future uh, voyages uh, discussions, and um, so you can, you can kind of understand how that works, but it relies upon having fresh fruit and vegetables. So, so from the early 1500s to the early 1800s, the Manila galleons took that route as well. They would sail from uh, Acapulco across the South Pacific in the trade winds to Manila, and then they would stock up on Chinese trade goods and such, and, uh, and then sail north and uh, cross the southern end of Japan and follow that, uh, the current across and, and then come across to somewhere between Washington and Northern California who's where they would arrive on the coast and then they would sail south back to Acapulco and deliver their goods uh, where they would uh, you know they would uh, take it in wagon trains across Mexico to Veracruz where they would sail it back to uh, to Spain and that that went for 300 years the Manila galleons made uh, hundreds of journeys so in any event, um, the Japanese pilgrims that arrived um, landed in, may have landed in where, what's now La Jolla, uh, California. So the, an archaeological site there is, uh, had found 19 skeletons there. Uh, all of them had distinctly Japanese characteristics. Um, so they, uh, the, the Chumash Indians who lived in California at the time had a... Um, what they would do if, if someone died, they would cremate the body. So they, they, they used cremation methods uh, all the time. But these uh, 19 skeletons were, um, they were not, uh, 
uh, cremated. They were they were uh, they had very Japanese characteristics in them, and they, they, they can't tell exactly, but uh, they they uh, they can tell quite a bit. Um, and these these were just not cremated, so um, they were very very different uh, using DNA analysis than than the local residents of the time. So. Um, but they had a lot of characteristics. Well, I'll, well, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, the, the California location is pretty close in latitude to the uh, northern slopes of the Himalayas where Shangri-La's entrance is supposed to be. Um, anyway, so the Buddhist concept of centeredness and stillness applies to all natural things, not just people. So. That includes rocks and geology. So uh, now everybody knows that Southern California is a geologically active area like Japan. So uh, it's pretty possible that within a short amount of time you know, after landing on the California coast, they may have experienced an earthquake. Um, that happened to me. I moved to California in the summer of 69 and in, uh, in uh, early months of 1970, they had the big Silmar quake. So it was it was fairly shortly after I first came here that I experienced a pretty good earthquake. So, um, so this would have convinced them anyway, the Japanese, if they were there, that they uh, had not located the center of the earth since the center would be, you know, balanced and still. So the group set out inland uh, to discover the true center of the earth. Uh, now, it's, it, goes to show that uh, the uh, the expected uh, la longitude of of uh, uh, Shangri La, 180 degrees about that is about the four corners area where uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado come together. So um, the Japanese may have gotten there, and uh, the, living there were the Anasazi people. Uh, <clears throat> So the Anasazi people disappeared about that time. Interestingly enough, they broke into into other tribes. So, um, you know, the uh, Mesa Verde is the is the location where this where this all happened. So, um, in any event, that the Anasazi tribe uh, broke into several groups. So the main group headed south into Mexico. Um, and then other factions became the Hopis, Zunis, and Pueblo tribes. Pueb Pueblo tribes, yeah. They're thought to have uh, descended from the Anasazi. So. so one of the beliefs of the Anasazi was that mankind rose from within the earth through a tunnel to the surface. And this kind of is maybe interesting to the, to the Japanese because they were they may, were looking for Shambhala uh, as well, which uh, was uh, the, the whole concept of uh, coming out of the earth uh, from uh, a superior being. So um, anyway, they, uh, they, the, the men of the, of the Anasazi uh, would go down into, into caves and then they would have their religious uh, ceremonies and then arrive back out. So. Um, the Anasazi were also keen observers of the stars. So, you know, so far uh, this uh, evidence of a expedition from Japan to the Zuni lands is pretty speculative and cir cir circumstantial. I mean, I don't I don't have much to go on. Uh, there are there are no uh, major artifacts that you can point to and say this ship or or these people or whatever. Um, uh, I, I have in some other in some other areas we can we can point to that, but uh, maybe the La Jolla, La Jolla skeletons uh, are an issue. But um, much of this is what the Japanese pilgrims could have done or had the technology to do, um, and and maybe maybe or maybe not. It's uh, it's uh, true. So. Evidence of the Japanese presence in Zuni society, though, is, is pretty, uh, um, it's got more hard evidence. So it's got genetic, linguistic, and uh, very strong cultural connections. So um, the Zuni uh, Indians um, speak a language unrelated to any other North American tongue. So now most, uh, you know, 
most people can trace the evolution of languages to uh, common roots, you know, like a an Italian and a Spanish speaker, uh, you know, can kind of understand each other. Uh, Portuguese, throw in that in there too. Um, and Spanish, um, you know, uh, they, they can kind of understand each other because they're based on a common, on Latin, you know, even, even French, uh, if you look at it, uh, is, is fairly similar structures and grammar and word forms, that sort of thing. Although they're spoken a little bit differently, but, um, so if it, this were true, you know, you would expect the Zuni, Hopi, and Pueblo tribes to, if they're all descended from the Anasazi, that they would each speak of derivation of the same language using the same structure. And this is true of Hopi and Pueblo languages. You know, two people can understand each other. Uh, they may speak differently and they may have different pronunciations and such, but, but they, uh, um, they can partially understand each other. Uh, Zuni is a very different language, though. Uh, very few common words and almost no grammar in common with the uh, Hopi and Zuni uh, languages. So, uh, most languages, uh, including English, use a subject, verb, object, sentence structure. You know, you would say something like, I eat fish. Okay. So, the subject of the sentence is the pronoun I, and the verb is to eat, and the object is fish. If you say that in Spanish, it would be exactly the same, you know, yo como pescado, you know, yo is I and como is eat and uh, uh, pescado is fish. So it, it, it goes in that same order. So subject, verb, object. Now, Japanese, on the other hand, uses a very different structure. It's called its subject, object, verb. So to say I eat fish in Japanese, you would say watashi wa sakana ga tabemasu. Where watashi is is the 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 object. Well, you wouldn't normally say that in common spoken Japanese, because, but I'm I'm kind of formalizing a little bit here. So, it's the program. It's the pronoun for me. So I, you know, it would be watashi. Sakana it means fish. So watashi wa sakana ga tabemas. So um, and then tabemas is the present form of the verb to eat. So you would say I fish eat. Or in, in modern Japanese, you know, if you were just speaking to someone, you would just say fish eat, would mean me <laughs> implied. So, because you don't use, you don't use pronouns much in Japanese at all. So, so but there's only two languages in the, in the earth, on earth that use uh, the subject object verb structure. It's Japanese and Zuni. So, um, the wa and ga in the Japanese sentence above are, are postposition words as opposed to prepositions. So you, you, you would use them after a word instead of before a word. It's an, another unique feature of Japanese. So um, the Zuni language is the only other language in the world that has postposition words, <laughs> unlike any other Native American tongue. So. Um, in Japanese, if you want to indicate the negative, you modify the verb with a suffix. So in, if you wanted to say, I do not eat fish, or I don't eat fish, you would say, sakana ga tabemasen. And the, the sen at the end uh, negates the verb. So instead of tabemas to eat, you would say, tabemasen, not to eat, or don't eat. And, um, so you use the word N on the end of it. It's it's the the uh, suffix is the uh, is is N. So that's a very unique uh, structural aspect of the Japanese language. Um, so the entire word world, including all North American uh, native languages, um, uh, except one, use modifiers uh, ahead of the verb. <laughs> so you would say don't eat or not eat or or something like that. Um, Japanese uh, uses suffixes, and the only other one that doesn't uh, is uses the w word m instead of n, and that uh, changes the verb to negative, and that's a Zuni language. So, another interesting uh, aspect of Japanese is the is the use of the suffix achi. So, um, you would use it to pluralize pronouns. For instance. The, the uh, Japanese word for I would be watashi, 
and we would be watashi tachi. So you would use the word tachi to to uh, pluralize a, a pronoun. So um, there's one other language in the world that uses that, and it's Zuni. So <laughs> Zuni, you would use uh, achi at the end of a word to pluralize it as well, from you know uh, from singular to plural. So uh, could this be a con coincidence? Well, it's possible, but pretty unlikely when, <laughs> when you take the other structural simp uh, similarities between Japanese and Zuni. So, a Zuni veteran of World War II, uh, after reading this book, Nancy Yaw Davis's book, said, I, I always wondered why I, I was able to learn Japanese so easily. So, here's a, here, consider these some words here. In English, we call it a river. In Japanese, it's called Kawa. And uh, in Zuni, it's Kawina. So, summit is Kashira and Kazawa in Zuni. Wood is Takichi or Ta. A leaf in Jap Japanese is Ha, same in Zuni. A mountain is Yama. They call it a Yala in uh, Zuni. Uh, anger is Ikari or I Ikati in, in Zuni. Awaken is Oki. And it's Okui in Zuni. So I could go on for pages and pages in this, uh, with these similarities between the words, you know. So um, there's, also, uh, there's also some um, uh, things like the late emperor is called the Koko in Japanese, but God is called a Koko in uh, Zuni. Uh, society is called Kwai in uh, Japanese, but it's Kwe in Zuni. Uh, rain is ame, uh, rain in Zuni is ami. So, you know, the, the list just could go on forever. So, um, so now the uh, Japanese symbol of the emperor is a is a sixteen petal chrysanthemum. Um, it's you've probably seen this symbol before. It's a it means the Japanese emperor. So the, in Japan, the emperor is uh, considered a deity, and this symbol is kind of considered sacred. So um, the Japanese rifles, for instance, at the end of World War II, the Arisaka rifles, were, they had this symbol on them, and, um, and the Japanese requested that uh, MacArthur grind the symbol off before they, uh, or the Japanese could grind the symbol off before they could uh, turn in their rifles after the war. So it was, it was a disgrace to surrender a symbol of the emperor. So they, they, uh, they actually did grind them off. If you were, if you were to go buy a World War II Japanese rifle, um, most in, in the vast majority of cases, this symbol would be ground off of it. Um, <clears throat> If you find one with an unground mum, it's kind of considered rare, and uh, they, it, it's got a considerable premium in the collector market. So, it, it would indicate a battlefield captured rifle, not one not one's uh, surrendered after the war. So, um, there are no s similar flowers to this chrysanthemum in the Americas, and nor is there any other symbol among the uh, American Native American tribes using this. But the Zuni have a sacred rosette symbol that's a virtual copy of the chrysanthemum, and it looks like this. Other aspects of the Zuni religion, such as the balance between good and evil, you know, hot and cold, male and female. In other words, you might know them as yin and yang um, from the Taoist thing, um, is unusual among, uh, among North American tribes in the belief system. But they're an important part of the Zuni religion. And uh, so the other uh, similarity of the, the concept of ki or chi in Chinese or ki in, in Japanese as a life force generated by all living things. Um, the, the, typically, it's uh, breath lines drawn um, originating in animals. You know, typically, uh, especially deer uh, being expelled into the atmosphere is is the way to symbolize this. So carvings and descriptions all, all over Japan show these breath lines being expelled from deer. So. Um, 
Probably the most famous are pictograms on bells, you know, um, but interesting enough, virtually identical pictograms appear in carved petroglyphs in the Zuni territory, commonly showing deer, you know, which was a considered sacred in Japan. Um, the physiology of the Zuni is also has a lot of Eastern connections, you know. For instance, blood type B, um, it's very rare among Americans uh, and Europeans as well. Um, and um, almost all the tribes of North America, it's a very rare, rare uh, type of blood. Um, but it's very common in Japanese, uh, and it's also common in Zuni. So uh, there's a couple of diseases that uh, are very rare, except for Japanese and Zunis. Um, and modern uh, measurements of tooth shapes of the Zunis um, are you know, very different than, than the tooth shapes of any other American pride, but they're very closely associated with modern day Japanese. So if the Zunis were descendants of the Anasazi, they must have had an influx of Japanese uh, genes because the Hopis and the Pueblos and other Anasazi don't have these characteristics. So that re kind of reinforces the connection of uh, language and religion. So, um, a, um, something I ran across that's very different than Nancy uh, Davis's things was uh, uh, there was a uh, group uh, from Arizona State University. Uh, uh, there was an Indian expert named Evan Hansen. He was training volunteers in the VISTA program uh, on the Indian reservations, particularly the, uh, the Zuni reservation. And they uncovered a, an old trash heap uh, with pottery shards dating from about 1200 AD. And they found these heavy brown stones that were unusual, but they figured out it, it, it would pick up with a magnet. So these stones um, were actually made of steel and not iron. They were, they were, it was actually steel and it was folded and forged into layers, thin layers. So. Um, you may have heard that Japanese um, uh, uh, swords are, are made by pounding it flat, folding it over, and then pounding it flat, folding it over. So it's made in layers, um, and this, this uh, modifies the crystalline structure of the steel. I could get into some, um, some metallurgy with you, <laughs> I, I would, probably would uh, if, if you were interested but um, that talks about how you can change the structure of steel to make it tougher and stronger by, uh, by um, you can do it, you can do it chemically and, and with heat treating, but you can also do it by hammering it and folding it into this uh, uh, more stronger and, and more flexible structure. So um, anyway, the Japanese had a thousand years of uh, experience working iron when they, when in 1200 AD, they've been doing it for a long time. Um, but the, but the uh, Zunis of, and Anasazi of the area, they had, they had none <laughs> working iron. So they were all, uh, they were all uh, flint nappers. You know, they, 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 you've, I'm sure you've seen arrowheads and all that of Native Americans. And, and they used, uh, they used uh, stone tools, not, uh, not metal tools. So. Um, anyway, um, you, you may have heard of this Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Uh, they, um, they had, uh, uh, it's got many, many rooms, uh, and it's between 900 and 1270 by the Anasazi. So, um, it was built. And if you look at it, some of the later, uh, beams put in there were, um, were, were wood, but they were actually cut by saw. So um, here's, a, here's a picture of, of some saw cut beams that had been there since the 1200s. Um, that, that had to be an iron device, not something the Anasazi could have produced be, uh, with, uh, you know, it's not hewn out of wood that, that an Anasazi would have uh, had of, out of stone tools. Um, this was actually sawn using a, using an iron saw. So um, anyway, they they they've discovered evidence in in uh, around Pueblo Bonito of 
iron slag that may have been uh, produced uh, by the, by the making of iron and and uh, you know primitive methods. Um, there's is forced air smelting that uh, originated in China about 200 B.C. Well known in Kamakura and, and Japan, and but not used in Europe until much much later. Um, they found that in in the uh, in some of the iron slag there. So. Um, and they found, you know, or this was around Anasazi pottery shards dating to 1200 AD. So, um, you know, could the Anasazi somehow developed iron smelting technology using forced air and steel forging technology to produce strong, flexible tools? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but, you know, this is a thousand years of technology developed in, uh, in China and Japan, uh, uh, crammed into a small instant in time in 1200 AD. So uh, there's never been any, any findings of intermediate technology, you know, that, that could have led up to these advanced techniques. So, you know, and by the time the Spanish arrived, you know, uh, 300 years later, 1500s, you know, all traces of this had disappeared. Um, so the only evidence that this iron and steel working technology um, was around, uh, you know, um, is in the Anasazi or Zuni civilization, uh, was that it was brought in by someone else. So, um, anyway, um, it seems certain that uh, med medieval uh, era Japanese Buddhists made uh, a journey from their homeland to, uh, to America and live uh, with, with the Amer Native American tribes that eventually became the Zunis. There's just too much uh, hard evidence pointing to this in the philosophy, religion, arts, technology, and language to be a coincidence. Uh, it just could not happen. So, so was there a voyage? I think so. You tell me. Thank you for watching.